All right. I think we are live. Let's see. We are live, folks. LinkedIn Live talking here about generative AI and content. We have two guests with me today, Laura Hill. Laura Hill is a marketing consultant and also works with SoftEd here on a lot of our marketing campaigns. And then we have Gordon Johnson, who is the president of Flashworks Marketing. Um, we like to welcome both of them here. Are you both ready to go and dig into content and generative AI? Yeah, We're let's ready. do it. You ready to rock? Okay, good. So Absolutely. we know that this topic, yeah, we know this topic changes all the time. So we understand that what we're talking about today may change next week. But here we're talking about what we know, what we've messed with, give people examples, give people thoughts. So we're going to throw the first question at Lara here. Lara, what tools are you currently working with? So I've experimented with several tools. The ones that I've actually integrated into my content marketing workflows are, of course, ChatGPT. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Everyone's pretty familiar with that one. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later, I think. But, um, you know, that one's focused with the text outputs for content marketing. But some of the image and video ones that I'm using include Midjourney, Runway, Ideogram, uh, Gloss.ai, and they all serve a slightly different function. Um, Gloss.ai is more about taking the outputs of your videos, like your webinars, that type of thing, creating short snippets, having that editing function and pulling out important pieces from longer presentations and making it an and like doing it a minute. That's good for that social. Yeah, yeah. like doing something a long in a, How long would that normally have taken you before? Oh, gosh, it is so time consuming to do it because you have to watch the whole thing. So if it's an hour long presentation, you're watching the whole thing and then you're thinking about, OK, well, where's the minute uh, the best two, three places to snip content? And so maybe, you know, two hours, you know, to output the video file. Working with video can be so time intensive. Uh, when and you're now it's like, is it like uh, this? Yeah, I mean, it's happening literally while I'm sleeping and then I wake up and I just, you know, it's not always perfect. I'm going in and tweaking it a little bit and then outputting the file, but it's so much easier to have a starting point than to just be starting from scratch. Can, you show, us that, um, can you show us that document from Midjourney that we talked about in the green room before the session? Oh, yeah. So um, Midjourney, um, I, I was just actually playing with Runway, which I have just barely started to experiment with. Anyone can go and set up a free account if you want to play with the um, text to video outputs and some of their other video outputs. But um, for this example, I started in um, Midjourney to create the the look and feel of, of what I was going for. This, I'll add this to here. So you can see the the young girl here, I was just trying to see what the quality was like. And we started in mid, I started in mid journey making the character and then brought the character into runway to make it into a video. And so this, you kind of see this time lapse of her aging. Um, mm -hmm. So, and you know, we're hearing things like this is the start of a, a new golden age of cinema because of these AI tools that are available. So, so many of us who don't have a background in video production or even that much of a background in design, we can start to use our creativity and, and put them, put these tools to use to kind of see, like, if you have an idea for whatever it may be, now you can kind of bring that to life. And, and the picture is worth a thousand words, you know, a, a, vid, a, a video is worth like a million words, right? It's crazy. It's like, how much more can you, can you direct some of these thoughts and feelings when you can put stuff like this together? Right. I mean, it's so much more powerful. And then, um, Gord, let's jump over to you on the tool side for a little bit. And, um, what are your thoughts on the tools? Yeah, that's interesting because I, I think that, Laura and I have taken a different approach uh, because I'm more focused on text and graphics, not really about videos and things like that. And somebody told me that really you're, you're going to be boiling the ocean if you try to learn all these different apps that are out there. Because, you know, a, a new good one comes out literally every day, pretty much, that kind of replaces the one you've been using. So it's, it's a constant kind of hamster wheel if you try to keep up with it. So it's what I recommend to people and, and what was recommended to me is really you should focus on 
one or two tools and get really good at those tools because really the functionality and what's out there just even for chat gpt or chat gpt plus four is you're, you're only going to use five percent of its capabilities at the most so that's what I, that's the approach i've taken so i'm again chat gpt i'm also using dolly for just simple images so i just so really, tell me about dolly mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about it how does that work yeah so it, it's similar to what laura just said and it's like chat gpt you know like for instance i want a graphic for a new ebook i just wrote so just type in the prompt uh, give me a graphic that shares uh that shows the transition between one thing to another um modern technology to old style or whatever and boom you know within about 30 seconds you have about 10 images to choose from um, what's the quality look like from your perspective so it's the quality is high, like what Large showed you as far as the 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 graphic resolution, the how real it looks, and it's certainly not cartoonish, and you can change it to different artistic styles and things like that. So really, it kind of if you've ever used stock photos to where you go look for stock photos and spend three hours looking for one stock photo, you can create it in what two minutes? You can do this. I'd say the most it would ever take you is five to 10 minutes to come That's up with what I will something add. that works. Isn't that and amazing? It costs less too. So. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, there's a level between return on quality I talk about a lot, you know, and sometimes you go way too deep on quality and you, and you don't get something out. And this is a situation you could build something that's relevant. Then you can focus in on the meat and potatoes of what you wrote, yet still give it a little pop with that image. And, you know, the thing is, if you spend two hours looking for a great image, stock photo sort of image, everybody else found that image, too, because it's so great. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. you're going to find it on other websites. You're going to be like, ah, oh. so these are going to be more unique. They are going to be unique because, you know, nobody else has what you're going to use. So um, I've been playing with Claude mostly. So I'm wor you're working with Claude, too. Now I did buy chat GTP4. Um, I'm mainly text-based. Um, I'm mainly building examples for people to understand the type of information they can pull, how they can interact with the systems themselves. Um, but Claude is really cool for me. One is like an input, like an input document, so I don't have to cut and paste in, which I really like. And I just like what the output is. I've done a little comparison between ChatGTP4 and Claude 2, but not enough. But it just it seems like for me and with the stuff I'm doing. Claude 2 seems to be a really good tool. The funnest thing I like doing with ChatGTP is asking it questions that it doesn't know because its data set ends in September 2021. <laughs> so I asked ChatGTP the other day live, um, tell me about Claude 2. And it couldn't tell me about Claude 2 because it came out after the data set. It even says it. It's actually yeah. pretty interesting. So, yeah. you know, like you said, Gordon, you did your research. You figured out what works best for you. And then you focused in on those tools to get the best use out of them. Yeah. I think that's, that's freaking genius. That's awesome. All right, so we talked about tool side. If anybody has any thoughts out there about tools they use, what they like, any comparisons, don't hesitate to put that in the chat. We're going to jump on to on the language side of things. So we kind of talked about this, but on the language side of things, Gordon, tell me what really gets you with chat GTP. Do you like the prompting? Do you like the communication back? Do you like the output? Why do you really get into that one from a text perspective? You know, like you're you're using Claude too, and I'm using Chat GPT, and we're kind of getting the same results out of them because it's really more about using it, understanding what it can do, what it can't do, which takes a while. You know, you suddenly you'll get surprised, but that was a bad response it gave to me. Why? You know, and so you start honing in on what it can do. But again, I'm I'm only five percent to be honest with you, what it can yeah. do. Yeah, you're um, still trying to figure, you're still trying to work through it. But I think, uh, you know, some, I, it might have been you, David, who said something that looking at these tools is kind of a writing buddy. Uh, yes. you know, it's the best writer you've ever met is sitting right next to you. And, you know, you try to Your do buddy. you try to do certain parts and you finally you hit a, a kind of a brick wall and I can't come up with any more ideas. And you look to your buddy and say, OK, here's what I got so far. What am I missing? And I mean, usually using those words. It's, it's amazing, right? What chat GPT or these others can do is say, what am I missing from this list of the top 10 things to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So you put it in there and you say, Hey, I've, I've written a document. It's about 200 words. It's about this. What do you think I missed? 
yeah, it's, it's, it's just incredible. And that's a great tip too, because I think a lot of people will skip that step and they'll just ask for a first draft. Um, and I think it's so important to do what you said, Gordon, and give it a sample of your writing style, tell it the audience, tell it as much information as you can so that you get the best possible output. Because if you're just asking it to write on X topic and it comes out you know, sounding however it thinks, it's just guessing how you might sound. I think what I'm seeing is people are posting content and it's losing the human element. It's losing um, that like unique voice that each of us have. And I think that we're just doing ourselves a disservice if we're publishing content that we haven't, it hasn't like originated in our minds and in our voice. And if, yeah. we, if we don't start with a good um, amount of the right prompts and the right amount of sample content, then we're losing the outputs that if you're just posting outputs without that, you know, it's, I think you're just missing out on a huge opportunity to put your voice out there and be a thought leader, have a personal brand, because otherwise it's going to sound very generic. And I'm even able to kind of spot sometimes when some content seems to be written by GPT. I mean, it's never, you never really know, but sometimes it'll use words that just aren't in our common everyday language. And you just know that, you know, that that person wouldn't have used that word. That that doesn't really sound like a natural thing they would say. And and it I think it just kind of makes you look like um, generic or, you know, it loses that touch. And I think if, if you have become to have a reputation of putting content out there that doesn't have that genuine human voice, then um, people aren't going to engage with you. It's it's going to be noticeable. Right. And that's that's going to be the lashback. Uh, is people are going to get so good at detecting when it's chat, chat GPT wrote this or whatever tool it was, because it has a voice. You know, it, it, you can look at writing, and you say that looks kind of like, but you know, you can have these things create right. stuff and you can have things create stuff in your voice. And by the way, I just put yeah. in the chat screen that the tool, the, the tool to use to detect whether something's a chat bot is chat is GTP zero. So you can actually put something in have it look and see, okay, how chat body body is this? This is what you should change. That's awesome. And you can also, if you get an output that's just off in whatever way, you can say, uh, rewrite this. Don't use the words unleash and, you know, whatever words that sounded too over the top. You can say, don't use that word and give it feedback and say, this sounds too over the top. Can you tone it down and make it more casual and conversational and change the temperature level from a seven to a three, you know, you can be that specific and it'll say, okay, sorry about that. And it'll give you a different one. You know, so one of our listeners was talking about Jasper AI. So I just posted it up there. Thanks Joe for that feedback. Gordon, what were you going to say? Yeah. To add what, uh, to what Laura just said, I think a good rule of thumb is to always start and end the, production process yourself, you know, come up with a very detailed thought about what your goals are for whatever you're writing. If you're writing a blog or an email or whatever, find out what your goals are and don't rely on them to tell you which direction you want to go with what you're trying to produce. And then always at the tail end, always make sure that this is obvious, right? That you need to edit that document um, yeah. and you need to make it your own. Supervised, supervised, supervised AI, even in outside the generative AI, supervising the AI output is critically important for a lot of reasons, for sure. So I think where we're at now, and this is, I think, to be spend the entire time left over on this, but we have a couple other questions. So is the art of prompt engineering? And there's actually LinkedIn, Microsoft has a certification around this generative AI thing. I know there's a certification specific to prompt engineering. So let's talk about that from your perspective. And so, Gordon, you want to start first? Give me some of your techniques you're doing around your prompt. Pro, pro, God, your prompt engineering with Chat GTP three or five or four, three point five or four. You know, it, I, this is probably not the the mainstream approach, but I I try to take a sort of like a conversational approach. Okay. When I'm developed, let's say I'm I'm writing a blog, so I start out with. You know, here's I write. Here's my goals for this blog. I want it to be about this and, and show the 
relationship between this. And, you know, this could be just one sentence. And then it spits me out what it has. And then I just go back and forth as, you know, I'd, I'd like this outline to include these two topics. Um, or like Laura just said, you know, change the writing style. The tone needs to be more uh, loose or more formal or whatever it may be. And to me, it's kind of a, a back and forth thing. And, and I was thinking about this beforehand. It's like every time I do something uh, with chat GPT or whatever else, it seems like a different process to me. And I was thinking back to, I think it was John Lennon. They asked the question, how do you write a song? Mm -hmm. And his answer was different every time because some things, you know, I just this week, I wrote a blog without, with one sentence and it spit out uh, 800 words or so. And I think I kept 750 of those words. And I was like, this took me 30 minutes to do this blog. And then I've spent, weeks on things before oh, yeah it depends Just right depends, you know you know it's 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 really interesting too when you start looking at your prompt engineering around the chats you set up so one of the things i like to do is i have multiple chats going and each chat is a different style box so that i can go back to that chat and i could keep feeding it like all the chat box for project managers so every time i'm trying to write something for project managers i do it within that chat box mm -hmm. Because then I wanted to keep learning, keep learning about, you know, what project managers are, how I see them and things like that. Do you have different chat boxes open or how do you manage or do you just do it through all one box? I don't. And I and that's that's a great best practice, David. Mm -hmm. I can definitely learn from you, too, on this stuff. Mm -hmm. No, it's good. Yeah, so, Laura, give us your thoughts. What have you been working on? How you been yeah, doing well, that? just to keep going on what you're saying, I think chat GPT plus is now starting to give you example prompts because they know that this is something people need help with. This is the um, art. This is the, right. the prompt engineering is the basis for the text side of even the image side. So keep going. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. And what I found in the more of the design space is that if you follow the people who are really like the design professionals who are at the leading edge of this, a lot of times they will share with you their prompts and I learn a lot just by reading other people's prompts. And you can do the same thing, you know, in mid journey or, or a lot of the tools let you read other people's prompts. It becomes, you know, part of the feed. So I, that's how I've learned the most. And some of there's even tools that are just prompt tools where you pay a couple bucks a month and yeah. it lets you copy paste. If you're trying to get a certain look, it'll say, this is the type of prompts and, all the specifics that you need in order to achieve this look. So um, that's a shortcut. So start looking for those people on, on your LinkedIn feed or, or where that's where I found them a lot is on LinkedIn. Um, just start following the people who are putting out some of the most amazing uh, visuals and you will learn a lot because they, they share a lot. A lot of these communities are very much about sharing openly uh, this, that there's a, a really a sentiment of let's help each other out. Let's figure this out together. So that's where I've really learned a lot. Laura, you got a thumbs up out there, which is great. So I'm going to tell a little story I told yesterday in the presentation. I want you to, to kind of think about this for a second. All right. It's 1994 and I have to write an article about leadership. Okay. Leadership methods, 1994. All right, how long is that going to take me? Gordon, what's your thoughts? How long in 1994 would it take me to write an article about leadership methods? I think probably about eight hours, eight maybe hours spread out over the course of a week. Okay, how would you break that up? What would, what would be going on? And this is, and I'm putting you on the spot here, but what you, kind of how would you break that out? Yeah, so first you're going to look at a blank sheet of paper for a while. Yep. So that, that's one hour. And then you're going to, you're going to find out that you have no internet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh my God. This is all dawning on me as we speak. Yeah. You know? And then you're you going might... to go to the library and look at the card catalog. The library. Thank you. You have oh, to go to the library. Mm -hmm. you got to go then you ask David Manica because we were working together at that time, I think. Just about pretty close. Oh. Tell me about your leadership style. Well, I probably would have had a bunch of magazines. I used to have stacks and stacks of magazines back then that I kept that I would pull out for research purposes. 
Oh my gosh. And the books that you have books. behind you, just grab a book. I used to have instructors flying around with a suitcase just full of books in 1995 and 96. Okay. So blank sheet of paper, library, then you have to type it up. So Laura, what do you think? Same thing, eight hours, 10 hours. That's what I was thinking. I mean, depending on how much of a perfectionist you are. Okay. So now let's go to 2012. It's 2012 and I have to write an article on leadership styles. Say leadership styles for the project manager. Now it's more specific. How long would that take me in 2012? You're definitely going to the internet. That's right. You know, okay. you, you might look at the, the clean sheet of paper for about five minutes. <laughs> oh, you probably still look at the clean sheet of paper for longer than you think. Yeah. Then you go okay. to the internet. So then yeah. you go to the internet. So that cuts how much of your research time does that cut? So I, I think that, I mean, it could make it worse. I don't know. It could make I think it the cuts the time, worse. though. I, I think but it I, does ultimately cut the time because you don't I have think to it's go find cut the time. Yeah, two hours. Yeah, two hours, right? And then you still have to write. So basically, now, you, Laura, what do you think? The same thing? You cut back to research time? What are your thoughts? Yeah, maybe three, four hours. Okay. So now we're at three hours to write an article instead of eight across a couple of days because you had to go to the library. Yeah. All right. It is, it is tomorrow. I need to write an article on leadership styles for project managers. You know, it's a blog post. How long would it take me? I have 30 minutes. 30 minutes minimum. So, and that's, I think if you do it less than that, you're probably not editing, which you should be doing. Yeah. Um, and you're yeah, probably and it's not, going to depend on the length, of course. How long of an article is this? And how much you know about the topic already. You know, some topics you can just knock out. But I think 30 minutes minimum. And it still could take weeks to get it done. But I think 30 minutes to two hours, if you're trying to produce something and get it out the door. So what is the what is the, the equating factor here? I call it productivity. What can you do now with that extra seven hours from 1994, the extra four hours from 2012? And I think that's part of what I, I, I push upon this from a content marketing perspective is what yeah. do you do at that time? Research AI. <laughs> You're going to yeah, have to learn cool. AI. That's okay. the thing. It's like Research, yep. No one has learned about this. There's That's the big question, David. You and I talk about this a lot is who's going to train everyone on these tools? Well, mm -hmm. we have to figure it out first and create that training based on very specific use cases within specific industries because it's so different depending on those things like what's your role what's your industry is the industry regulated and a lot of industries can't even touch it yet a lot of companies they know it's banned because there's a lot of legal issues that are still being worked worked through with all of this so um you know the the opportunity is certainly there but we have to invest the time to figure it out for okay, ourselves so within our roles and within our companies and our industries Gordon, what's your thoughts on that? What do you do with this time? So my gosh, if you do this, you're going to get back a crap load of time. Well, I, I think if you're if you're in marketing, if you're in specifically like content marketing, yeah, which I do quite way. a bit of. The general consensus is you're going to write three blogs instead of one. Or okay, you're going to write four blogs instead of one. And of course, the danger of that is spitting out these really generic uh, things that hurt your your brand but here's uh, so the thing though wouldn't you be able to spend more time good. research wouldn't you be able to spend more time researching so okay i know this blog is going to take mm. me an hour so i'm going to spend an hour just digging around looking at how i would write the prompts up to get us to get some like, really cool output from this thing yeah. and then maybe the output would even be way better and more specific and more relevant like the internet helped us with relevancy right now, could this thing even be a tighter relevancy box? Yeah, that, that no doubt. And, you know, another thing to add to that is now today, you, me, everybody who's, who's listening in, you can write things that you would not have been able to write to, yes. in 2012. Uh, there are take a subject you know nothing about and learn the subject as you're writing it. It's, it'll take longer. It may take that eight hours, may take 16 hours but you will have gotten 
a lot of information. You will have done something you could not have possibly done. Before. I love that. See, here's the thing I think about when we talk about George Jetson and he, you know, he just pressed the button. He made a bunch of money at his pockets. But, you know, I think he had to be thinking a lot. When do I press that button? How do I press that button? Let me think exactly what time I should do. So, I, you know, I, I theorize that even though George looked like the laziest person on earth, if you ever watched the cartoon, he was really thinking. And look at the lost people. If you remember that show Lost, they're in that bunker and they had to put that crazy number in or do they had to really think about it. My hope is that this gives people more time to really deeply think so that then they can write something and then go off and try to pro solve the problems working with people. Yeah. Right. And so much of that good thinking time is done away from the computer. If not yes. always, when you're out on a walk, somewhere in nature, or you know, we are deprived of that time typically in our nine to five routines in corporate America. Uh, so I, I hope that that's true, David, that we get more time for thinking. And um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is using AI to be predictive and helping us make sure that the topic we decide to write on is something that's actually going to be relevant and stay relevant for the you know short-term future so that we can get out of it what we're trying to get out of it which is engagement and um you know the other signals that we're looking this is why we're publishing it in the first place so there's definitely ai tools that are coming out and that have been out that are helping marketers to kind of stay on the forefront of what's relevant what's timely because as we know from today's world of you know david you're always talking about vuca the volatility uncertainty mm -hmm. complexity and um, ambiguity because things are changing so fast and especially with ai uh the you know upgrades in ai and the technology is evolving so quickly we need to make sure our topics are not outdated by the time we do finish that block because things are it's moving. It's true. Up. It might change, right? And why, <laughs> why waste your time on five hours in the blog that the topic's going to change in two months, but you still need that topic and you still need it for those two months to stay relevant. Yeah, so um, this, is, um, this is something I want you to think about. You can, you can give me your thoughts. So the internet happens, right? I mean, Look what happened with people figuring out what to do with it. And I'll give you one great example. Like we used to do a bunch of DSL classes and, you know, we'd have to write up all the use cases like, you know, telemedicine and information and, you know, TV and stuff like that. Right. So I remember hearing a commercial that some said that someday I'll be able to watch any movie I want in an instant. You know what? That's it right now. I pay for that. Right. I, I can watch basically any movie I want to watch, I may get it for free. I may have to pay for it, but look what the internet generated. So do you see any things that, you know, might pop out of this? Because, you know, what's going to pop out of this is going to be amazing stuff. Have you thought about anything? Oh, gosh. Nothing at this point? <laughs> is it crazy? So it's going, to, it's going to be something we don't even think we need. You know, That's right right now. Exactly. <laughs> Did I think I needed to be able to get any movie? That was ever made? No, I didn't. But now, well, crap, I love know, it. When you think about David, you and I have worked together in in AI, you know, years ago, and we know what it took, even just a few years ago, to create an app. You know, now with this technology, people like you and I, if we want to create an app, we can create an app. You know, yeah. it's going to open up the playing field for someone who wants to take something from idea to prototype that's like actually a working prototype. I mean, it opens up the playing field to so many of us that don't have it the background in coding. It, yes, it democratizes putting stuff up on the website, uh, on websites. It democratizes the ability to create. Now that and how many ideas have we all had that were like, oh, this would be so cool if, you know, but the, what it actually takes or what it has taken in the past to bring something from idea to working prototype, a lot of money, you know, a lot of talent, the right, you know, skill sets, all those things coming together. You know, we've worked in the startup world. We know what it takes. Oh, yeah, um, it's crazy. And, you know, so this is opening up such a world of opportunity for startups, for small businesses, you know, even teams of 50 or 100 people, they might, they still might not have like a data analyst on staff. Yeah, now they, with ChatGPT4 and the code interpreter. You don't need a data analyst, right? Now, yeah, you, you can fail like so having fast. having a data analyst on staff. You can fail so fast. 
so fast. You can fail. But so then again, fast. You, I mean, you do have to know what to ask it to do. That goes so back to the what, phone engineering. You like take you have time. to know what yeah, questions to ask. And David, you're always great about, okay, well, I want to know this data. I want, I'm looking for this particular type of insight. You have to think, right? You yeah, have to start thinking, but, like, people. You gotta start thinking. Just getting the, the data back and then getting the visualization of the data is what's really exciting too. Now you don't have to have the ex the same level of Excel skills to visualize the data in a certain way. You can say, here's a data set. I'm going to upload this spreadsheet. If you have yes. GPT plus, give me the five best data visualization styles for this data. And there you go. You get chart, you get whatever different You're talking my language. You're talking choices of data visualization that you want or some that you wouldn't have even thought to ask for. I, it's going to disrupt jobs that have science elements like, you know, Excel professionals, data analysts, you know, certain graphic design jobs, of course, but it's going to accentuate the ability to, th if you can think, you can think so much faster, you can problem solve so much faster, you can test so much faster. Okay. Go ahead, Gordon. David, I got another one. Yeah. All right. Here's something you, you talked about movies. You can pick any movie you want. Yep. Right? Any movie that's been produced, you can pick it. I get it right now. So so let's say it's date night and you and your wife want to go to a movie, but you know the the move you want to go out to a movie or or some pick a movie, but you can never agree on a movie. Yep. So how about we just create a movie together? How about we say, okay, I want it to be a romantic comedy, I want it to be set in this time period, I want the hero to be a female, I want it to be, you know. No nudity. <laughs> yeah, you know. no nudity, no bad language. Yeah. Um, I want I want the, the, the problem to be something around the family or the kids. Yeah. Gordon, I love this happy idea. Happy ending. I want a happy ending. I want a happy ending today. And then oh, I want the most intense thriller <laughs> that I will never quite be able to figure out. And we, you know what? Yeah. That's doable. Not right now. I, I bet 15 minutes of processing time and you've yeah. got a movie and it starts up. It's, yeah. and it's going to be, it's going to be formulaic, of course. So it's going to, you know, it, it's not going to be groundbreaking. But everything is formulaic. <laughs> if, if you look at, if you watch that TV show about the making of the Godfather, I mean, the guy was a computer engineer from Raytheon and he knew the thor formulaic model for a sitcom and he just created a, an, an environment and he did the formulaic model and Hogan, Hogan's heroes appeared. Everything in entertainment's formulaic, man. There's some crazy art that pops out there, but wow, Gordon, that would be so cool. But and you're likely to enjoy that movie. Oh, Unless absolutely. You, and not, I got what I wanted. Remember when we asked, used to have the whole blockbuster thing? We would go to Blockbuster, we couldn't find the movie we wanted. Yeah. And their tagline was go home happy. You know, so this is guaranteed to go home happy. Guaranteed to go home happy. Movie. And so Aaron up here says, Can we name the actors? That's where they can make money. The actors can every time that a movie comes in and you pick that actor, they can make a certain percentage, much wow, like royalty. you have with yeah, like a royalty. Exactly. Man, and okay, we in the we, style of Francis Ford Coppola. Yes, <laughs> you know, right now, Chat TTP, I can write an article and say I want it in the style of Winston Churchill, and it will write me a script in the style of Winston Churchill. I mean, oh, so and, and you know, Stephen King did a, a Stephen King got into chat GPT and said, write me something in the style of Stephen King or something yeah. like that. And he was so blown away by what it produced that he filed a lawsuit against whoever it was who created the language model. He said, you obviously read my books and you're using them in the language model. So that's big. The big books thing are on the that. internet, Stephen King. The books are on the internet. Someone posted them up there. And so, of course, the bot reads it. That's what they do. Well, that's how they train it to know what good writing is. They've already, you know, there was an article in The Atlantic recently about the number, tens of thousands of pirated books that have been used for training. Um, so this is a big issue that will probably go to the Supreme Court sometime in the near future. Of, you I know, think you've got a Redefine lot of copyright. Like, what is fair use? How do we define fair use? Uh, so all of that is being sorted out. Or, start, you know. think, yeah, start thinking about your business opportunities now, just like we should have done. Remember, a bunch of us said, I wish I bought that domain. I wish I bought this domain. I wish I bought that domain. Start 
thinking like that. And from a content marketing perspective, there are so many software opportunities here. Well, anyways, like we went, we gone over with some really cool conversation. So we kind of talked about the tools. We kind of talked about associated with um, image tools, text tools. We talked about prompt engineering, different techniques in prompt engineering. You know, we have we covered the idea of how much more time you get now by using these tools, and then the reasons what you could do at that time. Any last comments, Gordon? Any last thoughts you want to provide? I I do have to point out that. This week, I did release a new ebook called The Guide to Supercharging Your Content Marketing with Generative AI. And I went through that same process that we just talked about. And so a lot of it was written by AI, but of course, I had to change 50% of it to be in my voice and to add things that I would have said that it didn't say. Um, but it's a great, great example. And, and also the images used in it or AI images as well. So Aaron says something before you talk, Laura, I want to mention this. Aaron, ultimately, I could have plagiarized before the internet. I mean, plagiarism is always going to be there. I could have went to Stephen King's book. I could have wrote my own book and pulled chapters out of that and tried to get away with it. You know, just because it's a little faster now doesn't mean that it cannot. It still can't be stopped. And the reality is just because it prompted out the style of Stephen King, Someone still has to use that, and if they use it to make money or use it for some type of a, a increase in their education, then you have a plagiarism system. So a situation. So it still comes back to the user. The user has to plagiarize. The system just gives you stuff. You have to decide what to do with it. So, Laura, what are your last thoughts? We could keep talking for a while on this, David, and, and um, there's just – so many directions to go in, but I did want to mention that we are planning AI day for software professionals, project professionals coming up September 28th. So you and I are both speaking and we have a, a great lineup of other experts talking about AI, different use cases, different areas, um, mostly related to project management, product ownership, business analysts, uh, that type of thing. But um, this is going to be a great opportunity to just spend a day and learn from some of the people that have really been experimenting with these specific use cases and within these roles. Um, I, I haven't seen anything else out there like this that's quite catering to this audience. So if you're a project manager or a software development professional, you know, definitely check this out. Well, I think, what is it? Tomorrow's the early bird deadline, David. And, and yep, you can the eight, that's right. just sign up by tomorrow. Um, but yep, yeah, it's coming up the 28th. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to hearing all the other presentations as well. Well, thanks, Laura. At this point, let's go ahead and sign off. Thank you all for listening. This will be recorded. You can certainly send a link over um, to other people to listen to. It'll be on Gordon's LinkedIn page, which is awesome. Thank you both very much. Fantastic Thank session. You. All right. Thanks, David. Enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. Have a great day, everyone.